Hey, it's I'm Peter Tassoni from the Washington State Department of Commerce, and I am the administrator for both the ABLE program and the DD Endowment, the Developmental Disabilities Endowment Trust Fund, which is a special needs trust. And so I'm going to give you a, a quick, um, relatively quick uh, overview of both programs. We'll do a little compare and contrast to try to tease out um, some of the nuances between the two programs. And at the end, I'll show some statistics and we'll talk about uh, upcoming things for F uh, calendar year 2022, just, just a couple months away next year. So those, um, those of you live, feel free to click in the chat if you have questions or stop me. There's a couple of places that I will be stopping to ask and uh, help with Christy's help maybe uh, uh, answers in the questions in the, in the chat. Otherwise, you can reach out to me at a later date um, with the contact information at the very end of the slide deck. But again, this is just a high level overview. Both um, programs have about 50, 60 pages of documentation to explain how the ins and out and how the programs work. Um, a nutshell, so folks have asked me and Tamara, who's usually my tandem given this presentation, is how can we sum up the two different programs in just an image or a couple words? And so on the left side is kind of the ABLE. So the ABLE Achieving a Better Life Experience Savings Plan has a much wider breadth of definition for disability. So there's a lot of people that do not have intellectual or developmental disabilities or and have cognitive disabilities so they can run their own account and so there are a lot more self-sufficiency um, and for the most part it's an account that you're saving smaller bits of money um, so it's more like the piggy bank um, whether short term or long term the special needs trust, on the other hand, is if you have a Daddy Warbucks in the family, a Jeff Bezos, a Bill Gates, or you know, other wives, you know, if you have just having to have a billionaire running around your family, that's going to drop a lot of money on your kid or on an adult um, beneficiary. Then special needs trust is a really big bucket. It can take an unlimited amount of incoming money. And so that is the big cash um, bags of cash that might be getting dropped off. But typically in our program, since everybody has a developmental disability, that usually a cognitive impairment. And so you need a trustee to run the money on behalf of the individual. So on the ABLE, they can probably do that themselves, but with the special needs trust, you have a trust manager taking care of the finances because the person can't do that for themselves. So think of Annie or think of the piggy bank. <laughs> but both programs solve this problem. So if, they're on, if the individual is on a federal means tested benefit program, then they are, have that $2,000 asset limitation. So only $2,000 of resources that can be in their savings or checking accounts, any type of IRAs or retirement funds, even under, you know, money that's stuffed underneath the mattress. And if they get over that limit, then what happens is the benefits either get suspended or diminished or even, even uh, terminated. And so there was no way to provide, a, there was no vehicle really to provide for someone to um, gain assets um, and pull themselves out of poverty. And so up, up until these programs, uh, there was no way to really accumulate wealth. And so we're actually um, making our poverty in order to keep their benefits. But fast forward, and we've got solutions. So both the Special Needs Trust and the ABLE program um, exempt any and all money that's in the account. So it's not counted, it's ignored, it's excluded. So it's a way for people to start accumulating some assets and keep their benefits coming. Um, and so that's really helpful if someone's wanting to become employed, working part-time, uh, maybe doing some community inclusion activities. Um, these programs are a great solution. It's also like you can make an equity um, argument. So um, as I was telling Christy, I have a son with Down syndrome and, and a daughter that's more typical. 
And so we can save for college for my daughter, but with our son, it was really very difficult to do anything that doesn't jeopardize his future benefits when he becomes an adult. And so now we have ABLE, which is a tax advantage way to, so that we can save money for both of our kids to try to realize their potential um, in the future. And so by tax advantage, it means the ABLE account is, it's not taxed. The earnings are not taxed. The money that goes into the, the contributions have already been taxed, um, whether there are wages or some, some person giving a gift. And so when you take that money out and use it, it's not taxed either. So it's not counted as income. It doesn't get any tax. Um, so it's, it's considered tax advantage. And these programs are modeled after the college savings, 529 college savings plans you may have heard of. Uh, here in Washington State, they're called GET and the Dream Ahead program. And so the Congress just added a little A um, in the IRS rules and the tax codes, 529A. Um, and special needs trust, however, are defined in Social Security Act itself. And that's section 1396. And that you really get to understand that Social Security Act is a behemoth law and that you're going to have 15,000 sections. I mean, it's hundreds of pages long. But it does allow for money to be put into the trust and keep the money protected and so the benefits can keep coming. But we have even further refined our program in that it's only available for people with developmental disabilities. So special needs trust can be set up for a much wider swath of disabilities, but for our program here in Washington State, it's only for folks that have a developmental disability. And the source of the money really determines what type of account we have here. So first party trust is the actual beneficiary's money. So they're working uh, and they're earning wages, but now they're going over that $2,000 limit because they can't spend all their wages in a month. And so they need to uh, shelter that those uh, wages somewhere. Or they got a um, social security did a back payment because they were under paying them for maybe several months to several years. And so all of a sudden the person got a chunk of money back from social security that they need to um, do something with. Insurance settlements, uh, court settlements, inheritances, uh, the, the $20 the person found on the sidewalk yesterday, that's all considered first money because it came into their name or it's in their name. And so you can still put in a special needs trust However, the state requires a payback for Medicaid services that were delivered to the individual after the person has passed. So there will be a lien against any assets remaining in the special needs trust to pay off those services. Third party trust is what we call, is like mom and dad's money or Jeff Bezos or Daddy Warbucks. Um, so it's any third party, which could be extended family, it could be charitable gifts, um, it could be even employers could be given a, a gift into the third party trust. And because the money was never in the beneficiary's name, there's no Medicaid recovery at all. So usually the primary donor, when they set up the trust, they, all, they name who's gonna inherit the assets when the beneficiary passes, assuming there's any assets left behind. And so it's just, it works just like a will. You tell us who we send the money to, and after the person uh, dies, then we'll make sure the money, any leftover money gets to them. And ABLE is this little hybrid, though, because it can accept money from any and all folks. So they can accept first party and third party money. So employers, extended family, charities can donate along with the beneficiary can make contributions, but as soon as it hits the account, it's now considered first party money. The uh, account owner, the beneficiary actually owns the money. And as a consequence, because it's their money, there's a Medicaid payback uh, for that too. And we'll get into that a little bit more later in the slide deck um, because for a lot of folks, that's a detriment to uh, getting into one of these programs. So again, both programs protect the assets. Neither one protects income. So some of those federal means-tested benefits are what's called a dual determination. They're looking at the income that the person's bringing in and they're looking at how many resources or assets, money that the person has 
And based on those two calculations, um, it will determine the benefits that they're receiving. You know, special needs trust are an actual legal entity. Um, so they file a uh, tax form every year. Um, and because of the trust um, setup, the structure, the beneficiary can never access the funds directly. We could pay vendors and other folks for, or for expenses and uh, costs that they've accrued on behalf of the beneficiary, but we'll never send the money to the beneficiary. While on the ABLE side, the account owner is in charge of the funds. And a lot of folks that are disabled are not cognitively disabled. And so they can make those type of choices of what they're buying, how they're saving, how they're investing, how long they're gonna hold on to the money or not. And so I like to consider ABLE the wild, wild west. Um, the account owner, the beneficiary is fully in charge of making mistakes with spending their money on things that will get them uh, tax penalties and taxes as a consequence. But if your individual is one that is eligible, but probably can't run their own account, then certainly in able to speak an authorized legal representative can do that work for them. And that could be mom and dad, a parent of a minor, that could be guardian, that could be power, a person with power of attorney over the uh, beneficiary. And so there are ways around it. But it really gets back down to the individual situation in the moment as whether you, if you're only going to choose one program, uh, these are some questions to think about that might lead you to one program or another. But what we're finding is a lot of people realize that there's the advantages to having both um, accounts is advantageous. And so they want that so that they can move money between the accounts and enjoy the benefits of the account as a consequence. Um, so that's a high level. That's a breakdown between ABLE and special needs trust. Um, I'm gonna go into the nuts and bolts, but just real quick, Christy, anything in the chat yet? No, I don't see anything. Okay. Um, I did have a quick question. Sure. I was wondering um, if you know of any kind of legislation to raise that $2,000 limit. Is there anything? Yeah, so that, that is based on federal uh, regu regulations um, okay. and rules. And so that's set for SSI $2,000. So there is a bill in Congress currently, and usually there's a bill every session. Um, and this one currently is going to try to raise that $2,000 up to $10,000, give wow. the right number of fingers up here, um, which would be great because, I mean, you probably saw the slide that we uh, calculated for inflation, cost of living changes, uh, or since it was last changed, would be at $5,000. So doubling that to $10,000 makes it more reasonable. You, know, you yeah. could actually have a reasonable car for $5,000. You, know, you could have enough resources at $5,000 that maybe you could pay your medical deductible or take on, you know, some type of expense, whether it's a wheelchair or retrofitting a vehicle or something to make the it better for the person. $2,000 is really an artificial floor for people. It's, it's almost at the point of punishing people. Um, yeah, to, it's very, you know. very low, very low. But All right, well, let's hope that that well, though, They have to open up the Social Security Act. And so there's a lot of reluctance in Congress to do that. So you know, okay. I don't know if it'll go anywhere, but yeah, they, there's a bill floated out there for it to change the limit to $10,000. Thank you, good to know, thank you. Um, we'll dive into a little bit on ABLE here. So at the time that the person um, registers or um, enrolls into our program, you have to be a resident of Washington State. So we use uh, tax dollars to set up the plan and so you got to be a Washington resident to, to enroll. You can leave the state and you don't have to close out your account. You can leave the state and use your Washington ABLE account anywhere you go in the, the continental United States, actually in the 50 states of the United States, because ABLE accounts work anywhere within the United States banking system. But the disability had to occur before the age of 26. Um, and so with our group, you know, when we're talking developmental disabilities, that is principally people are born with something, 
So it's not at age 26, it's not necessarily going to capture, you know, people that may have suffered a workplace injury, a motor vehicle accident, or some type of deteriorating condition that then led to a disability later in life. And so that's uh, one of those Congress, they put an artificial subjective uh, age limit there at 26. And that's what we have for the program, unfortunately. So resident disability before age 26. And you can show that by the individuals receiving or eligible to receive SSI or SSDI, or you can get a doctor or psychiatrist to certify the individual meets social security's definition of disability. And that's on that compassionate allowance list. And for social security, a disability means an inability to work. I mean, essentially, Social Security is a pension system. It's a retirement system. And so it's an inability to work. So um, if you're a service member, a lot of service members come out of, of the military having a percentage of disability. Um, they used up part of their body in their service, and so they come out with a percentage. You might have a workers' comp claim or an, a vehicle accident that gives you a percentage of disability because of the accident you had. That doesn't work for this program. It's got to be the social security definition of disability per, per their list. So a little bit different than perhaps a few people are used to. The DDETF um, is the same thing, resident of enrollment. Again, you can live, live out of state, move out of state, and still use your Washington uh, DD endowment. But you do have to enroll before the age of 65. And that's related to Medicaid rules. And again, we are, we're only open for folks with developmental disability. And that uh, determination or deeming has to be done by a representative of our uh, DDA or Developmental Disabilities Administration. And so frequently folks have you know, a planned action notice or some other uh, criteria uh, documentation in, in, with their case uh, that shows that that has happened. Um, and then you can get enrolled. But you're eligible, you've enrolled, you've put some assets aside. This is the fun slide. This is what you get to spend your money on um, in order to support that disability. So these are uh, 10 very large categories, very broadly defined um, buckets for people to spend uh, their money on. And it's things that you know, increase their independence, uh, quality of life, uh, medical outcomes, and, and stuff like that. And so whether we're talking a smaller child, somebody in transition, a young adult or an older adult, regardless of where they are in that lifespan or that life cycle, these 10 buckets are gonna capture just about anything you can imagine um, needing money to be spent on in order to support or supplement that person's life. Um, of course, the ones that we all really enjoy is uh, occasionally our uh, participants send us photos of their vacations or their entertainment and stuff like that. And that's always great to see that they're having fun and stuff. But if your eyesight's really good, or if your screen's big enough to see, there's actually three of these categories that have an asterisk by them. And so basic living uh, expenses on the top left side includes things like groceries, household supplies, um, and so with ABLE, you can buy those things. With the special needs trust, you cannot. Because the individual, especially if the individual or supplemental security income, that, that benefit is supposed to be paying for rent. It's supposed to be paying for groceries to support the individual. And so the special needs trust cannot do that. ABLE can. Same with the housing run right next to it to the right. Same, same situation for folks with SSI in particular. You know, ABLE, you can pay rent with your ABLE funds, but with the special needs trust, you cannot. And this is what some savvy parents have already figured out. It's like, okay, well, I can put a bunch of money into the special needs trust. I can transfer money over every month to the ABLE account, and I can go out and buy groceries for my ch adult child help pay with rent, maybe upgrade them into a better place because uh, we're going to pay an extra $200 a month over his benefits. Um, and so it feels may feel like a game in the system, but it's totally legit. Um, I mean, it's totally legal to do this. The third thing, the third thing is down at the bottom in the middle there, and it's really about funeral and burial expenses. 
So the ABLE program, after we're notified the person has passed, um, you got 60, 90 days to spend down the account on any outstanding uh, qualified disability expenditures. So, you know, you're having that uh, van retrofitted for a wheelchair ramp. And so the vendor was halfway through doing that job when the person passed. And so we can use the ABLE funds to pay it off uh, once the work is done. Uh, you can choose to wait until after the person's passed to figure out funeral and burial ceremonies. Um, here in Washington State, we have human composting. So whatever thing that needs to be done, uh, the ABLE funds, if there's assets there, they're there to use after the fact. Unfortunately, with the Special Needs Trust, with the DD Endowment, um, it is a, a legal entity on itself. And so when the person dies, the legal entity of the trust also essentially ends. So we can't do anything, spend money on anything that occurs after the person passes. So for funeral and burial in particular, you can buy and you need to buy a prepaid plan. So you have to pay for the ceremony before the person actually passes with the special needs trust. And so rent, groceries, and uh, what, happens if a person after they between two different programs. But otherwise, very big, um, very wide, very almost vague definitions by the IRS on these uh, categories because they want um, our folks to be able to spend the money on things that support them. One gray area though is really some of the immoral transactions. So you can go to the casino and you could use your ABLE funds to go pay for your meal, pay for your lodging, you could pay for the show, whether that's a comedian or a band or something. What you can't do is take that money and go gamble with it. You can't slap the $100 down on the roulette table. And that's considered a non-qualified disability expense. And that occurs a 10% penalty in taxes for that on that $100 um, when the IRS catches up with the person. So it's one of those things that do do a do and don't do a don't. And so um, things that are maybe considered immoral, um, and I know there's somebody out there that would make um, some type of quality of life argument that gambling gives me such a rush that it improves my life, but the reality is it's not a good way to use the money. And so that is, is not a, a road you need to go down. Go hang out at the casino, just don't gamble. Uh, we used to give this warning uh, a couple months ago before Social Security amended their policy, but originally it was only 12 months uh, of exemption on the money before they started counting it. That's been extended for another 12 months, so we're up to about 24 months. Um, but just a reminder to keep track of that because a lot of our folks got you know quite a bit of money during the pandemic that was unexpected and you know you do the math and that's over three thousand dollars which puts a lot of people over the two thousand dollar resource a lot of households families in particular are receiving the advanced child tax credit to 500 i think it's 500 dollars a month um that's not counted as income the same thing you have a 12 month exclusion on that which ends next month so there are six months uh, payments that the feds were given to those particular families uh, that qualified. Um, so these, the, those are some of the money on, something to be aware of, but getting the money out is pretty easy. ABLE is very similar to online banking. We have a very uh, online footprint. So you can either transfer money to the prepaid card and then turn around and use that prepaid card at retailers, uh, point of sale, you know, doctor's offices or restaurants, hotels, um, Walmart, Amazon, and you can use them online also, you know, to buy items or services that support the person's disability. On the ABLE side, you can also, we, you need to link a bank account so you can electronically transfer from the ABLE account to the bank account, and then you can either write checks you could go into the lobby and get money from the teller if you need to be. And so all that, those checks or the money that you're taking out need to support the individual and their disability on qualified expenditures there. We can cut you a check and mail it. We do paper checks too. Um, and so if that needs to happen, uh, you can do request that online or you can actually call up 
the service team on the toll free number and you can initiate a withdrawal with them or you can print the withdrawal form out from the website, fill it out and mail it in. And then we'll turn around and send that money however you, however you want it sent, uh, whether it be paid card, bank account, or paper check. But on the special needs trust side, on the DD endowment, um, as a trust, very paper based and it's um, reactive uh, reimbursement style. So, first, the money needs, the expenses need to be incurred, and then we reimburse for those eligible expenses. And so, you end up having to submit the paperwork filled out with receipts, copies of the receipts for the activities that you're seeking disbursements. You know, we can send multiple checks to different vendors if need be. Uh, you know, we can send stuff to your doctor, to your dentist, to your representative, um, you know, other, you know, the vendor that changed, that worked on the vehicle, um, that did the wheelchair ramp and things like that. Um, we can, and that includes rent payees because a lot of our folks actually in both accounts uh, are living longer lives and they're actually outliving their parents. And so frequently it's now an organization that's taking care of the person's finances or even uh, hosting them in some type of adult home or something like that. So uh, we can we also work on that, that side uh, so that our folks are not getting abandoned. Uh, basically, we allow for 12 disbursement events in a calendar year. Um, and so that's once, essentially once a month, you can send in all your receipts and maybe we have to write four checks to pay all the different vendors. Maybe it's uh, 12 checks, maybe it's just one check. But the, regardless of how many checks we write at that time, we just pulled the file once and that's considered an event, one event. And so you get 12 of those. On the 13th one, then we will start charging a processing fee um, to process uh, the disbursement and the, re and the reimbursements. As a consequence, the fees for the DD endowment may look a little bit more expensive. And that's probably true in some cases. But it's because the trust manager and the trust office is having to do a lot more work on behalf of the beneficiary than the ABLE account. So it does cost $600 to enroll into our program. And uh, we do charge 1% uh, fee against the assets if that's in the account with the first 75, with a minimum $75 and a cap at $750. Uh, there's because they're legal entities that, that are required to file a tax uh, return every year. Uh, the tax, the CPA charges $75 for tax preparation uh, in order to do that work. Our program does require a vesting. So this is uh, both time and money. So it's $600 to start. And then within the next three years, you have to put in a equivalent of at least $25 per month, which is $900. You could certainly pay your $600 and give a contribution of $1,000 on that first day, but you were gonna still wait for that three years to become vested. And at that point, the key about being vested is now you're eligible for all those matched fees. So if you go back up that list, Cost you six hundred dollars to join, but after that three years, we're going to put six hundred dollars back into the accounts as state funds, and you can then use that as a disbursement reimbursement. Seventy-five dollars of any trust uh, fee, the management fee, is matched back to the account. The CPA's uh, tax preparation fee is matched back at one hundred percent. Seventy-five dollars gets matched back. And so these are a way for lower balanced accounts and for uh, lower cost um, savings. This makes it a really reasonable, um, affordable special needs trust program, which are typically very expensive, usually take thousands of dollars to set up. And then uh, usually the management fees on those accounts are much more expensive. So it's a paper-based uh, process so we don't charge any additional fees for any of the mailings that we do whether you need copies of submissions that you provided to us your quarterly reports um, and the paperwork that we send out when you, we send a disbursement 
But on the ABLE side, it's a little bit different because we're online, we're more of a digital platform, although it doesn't cost any money, any money to apply or enroll into the program. We do charge a $35 annual maintenance fee. And we have a similar management fee against the assets charged quarterly, so the annual fee, but that's 30 to 38 basis points. And so that's a decimal 0 0.30 to 0.38%. Um, again, that we mentioned those non-qualified disability expenditures incur that tax penalty and taxes. And because we're digital, if you need things mailed to us, uh, mailed to you, here's your quarterly statement, that paper check that you want mailed to you as a withdrawal. Um, we charge a, a mailing fee for that. If you bounce a check, a contribution to us bounces, you know, wire transfers, um, occasionally rollovers and other transfers out of the program, um, also get charged fees, which is identified in our documentation. Record keeping, able, it's, Every transaction history is there for the individual. They can go into their account and they can see all their contributions and withdrawals. Um, they can see their earnings happening. Uh, if they're using the prepaid, the optional prepaid card, all that transaction history is also on the portal. Uh, statements, tax forms are all available online too. So you could either view them, you could download them. Um, and then if you actually need things mailed to you, then just give the call center a call. Uh, we'll charge you a little bit of mailing fee, but we'll get them to you. There is a nuance um, with how ABLE interacts with SSI program in particular. And, and as a consequence, we do report balances to Social Security monthly because what they're doing is just comparing the ABLE balance to their various SSI recipients to ensure that they haven't gone over $100,000 in the ABLE account, at which point they, that triggers actually counting as a resource or an asset, anything above $100,000. And we'll get into that a little bit more. So ABLE's digital footprint, go online and you can find it. With the DD endowment, however, paper-based, so the trust office keeps all that paperwork. Your joinder agreement, your master trust agreement, um, any disbursements and receipts that you've requested is all kept there. Anything that we've sent, uh, correspondence and stuff like that, we have records there. So it is a great repository. Should you ever get audited by a DDA case manager or social security, um, and we have at, had once had to go into the archive boxes to pull out all the, country, the checks and contributions to show that all that money came from mom and dad. And Social Security just wanted to ensure that um, you know, everything was happening correctly in that third party uh, trust. So, and we don't charge any mailing. We, we mail out the uh, quarterly statements. We mail out the tax forms. Um, and any disbursement and the corresponding documentation, we mail that out to you at no charge. Uh, so Social Security knows that we do not um, spend money on groceries or rent of the sort, so they don't. We don't need to report Social Security. There is no reporting Social Security because we don't do that as a condition of a special needs trust. Um, contributions are a little bit different. You know, again. DD endowment is an unlimited bucket. So if you have somebody that has a million dollars, we can take it. If you have somebody that wants to do $30,000, we can do it. And it could be lump sums. It could be regular payments. It could be irregular payments. It could be once in a lifetime payments uh, or contributions coming in. But we can only take liquid assets. That means you either have to write us a check or you could send up a bill pay through your financial institution which may feel like you're doing an electronic payment on your side, but in reality, your financial institution, the bank or credit union is actually mailing us a check and then we can deposit that. We can't take a home, house, real property. We can't take jewelry, bonds, um, you know, Microsoft uh, equity share, you know, if you have actual paper in the company. Uh, just like we can't take airplane vehicles, boats, anything like that. You would have to sell all those things first. 
liquid liquidate them and then take that money write us a check and then we could deposit or contribute that into the trust account and so again we're not commingling so the beneficiary first party money stays into a self-settled account while mom and dad's money only goes into the third party trust so the money stays separate there's two different trust accounts they're both special needs trusts but they both have diff slightly different rules around them on the able side of things, the Congress, I mean, they were generous in that they started the able um, program out uh, very much a game changer for a lot of people, especially people with uh, mental health challenges or behavioral health situations. But they capped the annual limit on contributions at the IRS gift tax exemption amount, which currently is $15,000 per year. So I could give gifts to friends and family of up to $15,000 before there's a tax implication on either the recipient or the gifter. That same thing works for ABLE. So it's that $15,000 annual limit. Um, that's another way that we keep it as tax advantage that we don't, there's not additional taxes incurred on that contribution. There is a $500,000 limit on lifetime um, for ABLE, but you do the math at $15,000 a year, you're talking decades before somebody ever gets up to half a million dollars. We take paper checks, you could set up the bill pay, you could do electronic uh, funds transfer, uh, EFT, or you can do the ACH, which is the automated clearing house, which is your checking account directly into your ABLE account, so electronic payment. And you can also use our e-gifting platform on the website and people can actually use their checking accounts or they can use their credit and debit cards to actually make a contribution into your, your into the ABLE account. And so because of that $15,000 annual limit will reject any excess contributions. So if it's the, 24th of November, and grandma wants to give Johnny a gift. Um, Johnny already has $12,000 in his, his account, and grandma wants to give fifteen or $5,000 more. Well, 12 and five is $17,000. We're over that annual limit. We are going to reject that full $5,000. So hopefully Johnny and grandma are talking to one another, and, and they figure out, well, grandma can give $3,000 in November or December of this year to get up to that $15,000 limit. And because the year, the calendar year is uh, January through December, it's a tax year, an annual uh, calendar year. Then in January 1st, it resets. And so grandma can give the other $2,000. And so Johnny gets the full $5,000. We just had to spread it over two years in order for the system not to reject uh, the, the contribution. Both programs do invest the contributions into various market portfolios. So with ABLE, there's actually four of them. There's the FDIC insured savings account, which uh, is earning literally almost nothing because of the super low interest rates we have at this time. And then we have three market um, portfolios that are a mix of stocks and bonds. And so those have different risks. They have different returns. Some years you can earn a lot of money. There are, there are some years that you do lose money. So it all depends on when you need to take the money out as to whether you realize that loss uh, or not. With the special needs trust, all the private donations go into an investment portfolio that the governing board uh, has chosen. And so that's a Vanguard balance fund with a 60-40 split. Um, again, both all these have been doing really well. And I'll show you some statistics like right now that for the most part, all all the wiggly squiggly lines are above that 0%, meaning they're having a positive return, they're earning money. But every once in a while, the market does have a downturn. And so whether it's ABLE or the developmental disabilities, um, there is the potential that you could realize some losses. Um, I just use uh, DD Endowment because they have a 20 year history while ABLE, we've only been open for three years and because of the pandemic, it has been really strange returns. Um, in the marketplace, so not a good three years to judge a long-term uh, trend. 
So again, we are talking about that Medicaid recovery here in Washington state, for the most part, it's uh, people that are 55 and older and living in essentially a nursing home will usually have some type of Medicaid recovery uh, lien put against their assets um, after they die. However, a lot of those DDA waivers uh, are also recoverable services. And so a lot of our kids may have been on various waivers and so they might have a lifetime of services being delivered. And so again, with ABLE, since that's considered first party money, it's mandatory that Medicaid can be standing in line for their share of any assets remaining. And if the individual lived in multiple states or received Medicaid services in those multiple states, you could have multiple states in line requesting the assets. Now, again, you have 30 to, uh, sorry, about 90 days to settle the accounts and pay off all those outstanding uh, qualified disability expenditures. And then Medicaid will then take their chunk. And if there's anything remaining from that, then of course, based on the will of the individual, it'll be dispersed to uh, those, those assets will be dispersed to whoever's, whoever is named in their will, or it goes to probate and the courts decide that. With the special needs trust, it depends. So those trust ones are third party, mom and dad's money, and those are exempt. No Medicaid recovery, you name who gets to inherit the money after Johnny passes, and we just turn around and send that money back out. For the self-settled accounts, which we call trust twos, that's first party money. And again, they have to go through a Medicaid recovery. And so very few of our folks actually have enough assets to pay off their Medicaid liens. Um, and so rarely do, are we able to pass uh, that on to the final remainder beneficiaries, like in a will. Um, and generally it does occur once every once in a while, and that's usually because the person wasn't on Medicaid very uh, very long or, or used it very much, or they do actually have a daddy Warbucks in their family. And so they had a high value uh, trust account. And so they're able to pay off the, the Medicaid uh, debt that was there. So uh, for new to ABLE is we're going to be able to start working with rep payees, social security rep payees, and so they can become uh, an authorized legal representative in 2022 as the expansion of ALRs goes into effect. You know, it's just a series of forms that the person would need to fill out or the organization, you know, definitely contact me and I can get you set up. The DD Endowment has been doing this for quite a long time. Um, rep payees just have to provide the trust office with appropriate documentation uh, about verifying their role. And then they can, as a consequence, start making reimbursements on behalf of the beneficiary. And again, this is related to frequently our kids you know, outliving us. And so there's usually some entity um, taking, taking care of them. And so uh, like the ARC in Spokane, the local ch Spokane chapter of the ARC, they run a couple homes and they also do rep payees. And so it is an activity that's happened around out there. In, in the special needs trust, primary representative is uh, very similar to ALR. And again, uh, we can work with organizations um, and just have paperwork, which I can get uh, folks connected to. Um, that point. You know, I did see a couple chats come through. Um, are they actually questions, Christy? Yeah, Amber had a question, but you answered it. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. She was asking about the, the fees for checks, and the next slide was about, about that. So, yeah, Perfect. thank you. Good timing. Yeah. So, I'll just push on. I'll uh, do some statistics about the two different programs, and then I'll talk a little bit more about what's coming up in 2022. Okay. So, ABLE is you know, pretty much a digital. So if you filled out the online forms online, you know, if you had this information at the step one uh, information, um, 15, 20 minutes to fill out the forms. If you actually linked your bank account, $25 initial contribution, you'd be up and going in three to five days, but probably not this weekend since it's a long holiday, but that's three to five business days. 
Um, and then if you needed to next week, uh, pull out that $25 to spend on something, you could do that. Your, your account is live and ready to go. If you wanted to download the paperwork from the website, fill it out by hand, and then you know put a stamp on it and mail it. Uh, if you mail us the paper check uh, for that initial contribution, it's just going to take longer. So maybe a couple of weeks before your account is set up and the money's in there and you could start taking withdrawals but a pretty simple process uh, to get set up. On the screen is a map of Washington State, a heat map, so the darker the green color, the more enrollments that we have from that particular county. And so you can see uh, the I-5 corridor and Spokane Valley are the, the darker colors. And that's essentially just mirroring where the people live. So where the people live is where we get most of our our enrollments, and you can see Great Harbor right there on the coast with a mighty 16 enrollees already. So that's awesome. You guys have able accounts in your county. This is a fun statistic in that this blue line shows the current age of folks that are enrolled in the able account right now. And that peak, that blue line, really ratchets up quickly in that. You know, that high school transition age, maybe, and then immediately after they've graduated uh, from high school in the transition program. So it's, I mean, it's the teachers, it's the parent coalitions, it's uh, folks like the ARC getting the word out and getting those kids enrolled as they're coming through or out of high school or through the transition plan, or they just started their first job um, out of high school. And you do, on the right side, I do note that uh, we have some uh, zero to 91. We have actually three folks that have not even had their first birthday yet enrolled into the program. And so that is awesome that we have some very young kids and their families are already starting to put a little bit of money aside for them to use later in life. The DD endowment is paper driven, a um, little bit different process. You can, of course, download the forms off our website. You could call up the trust office. We'll, we're happy to mail you the packet because um, it does, turns out to be about 50 or so pages long and that's a lot to come off of a printer. Um, the paperwork and is particularly the, the um, signature of the primary donor needs to be notarized. So that paperwork uh, needs to go usually through a bank notary or a financial institution or some other notary. Get that pa paperwork all in order. You bring it in, mail it in, you send it to uh, the trust office. They ensure it's all filled out properly. And then you submit that $600 um, enrollment fee um, and that and then we go through the process of actually setting up the account. You could have a second check for an additional contribution. You can make contributions at a future date. Um, again, we have to go through that three years and nine, at least $900 in contributions in order for the account to vest. Um, and so that you can start taking the money out at that point. You folks can actually set up, can name this program in their wills, in their estate and, and or set up the program and have a zero balance. And so, it, you know, we, we pay the $600, it just sits there until the person passes and maybe you, your life insurance or something about your estate is gonna go not to the person, it's gonna be to the trust fund because you've named the trust fund in your insurance your will in uh, court, if, if you have to go through probate court, that you're naming uh, the actual trust fund. And that way it never goes to the individual. That way it stays as a third party trust when it gets set up. And that way there's no Medicaid recovery that happens after the person passes. So a good estate planning tool and a good tool to use today um, if you're needing to put money aside for Again, on the screen, we have a map of Washington State and then a heat map, um, very similar to the ABLE account, but DD Endowment has been a lot around much longer. Um, as a consequence, they have a lot more money, uh, now about $105 million in assets versus ABLE's $20 million. But similar, I-5 corridor, uh, Spokane Valley, um, are where most of the people live, and that's where most of our enrollments are, and you can see Grays Harbor out there, got a mighty 22 in this program too. I mean, it does work for some folks. 
And this is kind of it. I like to go back to what I was talking about. Some about gaining about some folks wanting to maybe use both both programs together. How it feels like you might be gaining the system. Well, that yellow, that rather the orange bar in the middle there, that really tall one, that is where ABLE can actually buy groceries where the special needs trust cannot. And we're actually seeing that on the prepaid card where um, folks with ABLE accounts are actually doing that sort of thing. Perfectly legit, it's great, um, but there's the, the data to show that that activity is actually happening. We do have some comparisons. This is the one pager. There's also a four pager um, that kind of tees out a little bit of the nuances between the two programs. It's a great little checklist. It's much easier to read four pages than it is the 50 page documents and try to figure it out. And so I did send Christy both the slide deck and this four page handout um, that she can share with everybody and just about anybody um, now or in the future. But you could certainly um, text me or uh, at the office if you have questions. You can go online. We have a lot of materials on our websites, a lot of frequently asked questions. Um, we have videos, uh, little video blogs, it's kind of the how to. We've got some testimonial stuff. Abel's also, we've got social media. Um, and so we've got a lot of material out there to help people uh, digest the stuff. And if you talk to my wife, she'd tell you that, you know, I need to be told things seven times before I get it. Um, and I think for a lot of our listeners, um, thinking about estate planning, thinking about that transition at age six, at 18, for, as our kids come out of school, is a lot. It takes a while for this to sink through. And um, so I, I'm not pushing for enrollments. I'm here to educate. I have lots of materials to help you with that. Um, so please don't hesitate to give me a shout if you have questions and stuff. So I'm gonna stop share and then I'm gonna put some contact information into the chat and then we'll check to see if we have any new questions or anything. Awesome, thank you so much. I didn't see any chat questions come through. Amber, did you have any questions? Let me pull a couple more websites just to make it easier. Um, so hopefully it'll be in the recording too for folks. Yeah, for sure. And I am also going to put spell my name correctly and put my contact. <laughs> How come I can't get a hold of this guy? Well, he's still yeah. the name back. So what's up with that? All so right, so there's. You do you know if there is anywhere, I had a call the other day asking for like a list of representative payees. Do you know if- Yeah, so there's organizations, um, frequently it might be a family member of an individual that would get certified from social security. Um, so I think King County, May ARC may have a list of rep payees and also attorneys that work in estate planning and special needs uh, trusts in particular. Okay. Um, I know there are several attorneys that I've interacted with in the Olympia area. I'm sure they probably would cover uh, Grace Harbor too. But some of the stuff, um, at least on the guardianship side, of course, you have to go through the Grace Harbor Superior Court to get that stuff done. Rep payee right. is generated more, more by the, I think it's Social Security, but I don't know if the, the local field office does that work or if it's more at the regional Seattle level or not. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes a challenge for people to find that information. So Agreed. that is good to know. I will definitely, check out the, the ARC of King County's site because that is, they have such comprehensive uh, yep. stuff on there. Yep, more people, more money, more employees. So yes, lots of resources there, great people. For sure. Hi, Christy, I wasn't ignoring you. I lost connection again. That's I'm okay. <laughs> bad time tonight, um, but I didn't have any questions, but I did wanted to say thank you for your presentation. It was very helpful because I did sign my son up for an account. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, that's pretty. Yeah. Which one did you, did you do the ABLE or the trust fund account? The ABLE account. Nice. Nice. Oh, I, you know, I forgot to talk about what's coming in 2022. Silly me. 
<laughs> so we're able um, in next year, next calendar year, just in a little over a month, uh, the $15,000 limit was increased by the IRS to $16,000. So <laughs> next year, it will be $16,000. ABLE also has a second uh, type of contribution that's called ABLE to work. And so that is folks that are actually earning a wage um, and they can either put up to their wage, maximum of their wage for that calendar year or the single person federal poverty limit, which is 12,760 for this year will go up to 880 for next year, 12,880 for next year. Okay. And so if we do have a working beneficiary, um, like the former lieutenant governor had to be a person who was blind. Um, and so he could have been maxing out his ABLE account um, and putting nearly $28,000 per year in their ABLE account, which would be phenomenal. I mean, that is so yeah. different than stuffing your, hiding your money underneath your mattress because you have the $2,000 resource in it. Right, right. Um, That's wonderful. But, Yep. Another thing in ABLE, uh, the ALR, the authorized legal representative is expanding. So it used to be just parent of a minor. That's going to change to be parents of even an adult child okay. to include grandparents, siblings, uh, the extended family. So they could potentially be managing the person's ABLE account without having that authorized or without having to be a guardian, a court guardian, or have that power of attorney or the individual. That is great. It stacks down and gets down at the fifth level. It's ranked, it's tiered. Uh, even rep payees will become people that can run uh, the ABLE account. So that could be both individual or an organization that may be doing that work for multiple people. Again, just recognizing People with disabilities are living very similar lifespans as the rest of us. And as a consequence, they are living uh, longer than typically their immediate family, their parents in particular. Um, the last thing is uh, the way we do uh, contributions and withdrawals right now, if you're in uh, an investment portfolio and the savings, maybe you're doing an 80-20 split. So all money, $100 going in, gets split between the two, $80 here, $20 there, and we take a withdrawal out. It's also $80 liquidated from the market and then $20 from the savings account, which is clunky, takes a little bit of time, especially for you have to liquidate those mutual funds. Instead, you get to tell us when you put the $100 in where you want it, want it to go. You 70, 30, 80, 20, 100% in the savings, whatever. And when you take the money out, you get to tell us where the money's coming from. And for a lot of folks, if you choose that savings account, um, then you can get it out much faster than having to wait a day or two for us to sell those uh, mutual funds and get those proceeds into your account and then be able to send them out to you. So that's uh, pretty cool. Again, giving more control, more flexibility, more efficiency to the account owners, the ABLE folks, uh, so that they can be spending their money in the way that best supports their lifestyle with their disability. And then for general heads up, I, you probably know this, but the guardianship law changes in Washington state. So on January 1st, the new uniform guardianship goes into effect. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gonna include a new tier from conservatorship that used to be guardianship of the property. So those people that are now conservators can control an ass the assets, they can control the ABLE program uh, or account on to, for the beneficiary. And they're also gonna do supported decision-making models. So within the court okay. system, they're recognizing sometimes our folks, they're confident in so many ways, they can live mm -hmm. their life. They just need a little bit of help um, making some of those decisions. So that I think is really cool. That is more excellent news. More equity around, uh, less stigma around our folks. Yes, absolutely. I love seeing that supported decision making, getting gaining the traction uh, that it deserves. That's a great option. So that's good to know that that you know the able accounts and the trust fund accounts are kind of following you know um, with that with those law changes. So that's great. These are yeah, these are financial empowerment tools for mm -hmm. our participants for our folks. Yeah, wonderful. All right. Well, um, I think it's down to just me and you. So. Yep. 
That's all I have. But okay. then again, uh, if you have questions, give me a shout. And again, um, last time we did this, I think we had good weather. Previous time we had snow, but I'm happy to come back on an annual basis or whenever you need me to update uh, your families on these programs. Yeah, we would love that. It's it's nice to have um, a time of year and kind of a, a schedule that we can say, okay, you know, we know that we're going to get our updated information from you every year or at some time in the fall, you know, um, and, and share that out. So we appreciate yeah. you coming. And this is the gifting season is where a lot of folks give holiday right. gifts. So it's, it's it's a financial windfall, I guess, or high high activity for a lot of folks. For sure, and it's kind of the the wrapping up of the year, so figuring yeah. out you know what you need to allocate to what you know um, yeah. accounts and stuff. So yeah, all right. Well, thank you very much, Peter. You have a wonderful holiday, some days off of work, and um, yeah, we'll we'll see you next year. Sounds good. Thanks, Christy. Right. Take care. Thank you. Bye.